Hello, this is Haskell Hallmark with the Rio Rancho Church of Christ in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And Pastor Mark Tross with Victory Church of God in Grants, New Mexico. And the program is Cross Culture New Mexico. You can look it up on the web at Cross Culture NM. And right now we're in the Gospel of Mark in Chapter 2. We you finally made it. Yeah, we made it through Chapter 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised or reported that he was in the house. So here we go, back into the home. Mm -hmm. And straightway, or immediately, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them, which I think is a, just a great mm -hmm. way of presenting the gospel. He's mm -hmm. preaching really Jesus unto them. Jesus mm -hmm. is the word, and he's preaching mm -hmm whether it's, you know, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God is in your midst, the kingdom of God is among you. I think it's just amazing how, again, the Holy Scripture told them to, to write that down. Interesting, too, that you see that correlated to several different places. Uh, the uh, Ethiopian that was on the road to, to Gaza who had come up to Jerusalem to worship uh, the treasurer of the uh, Queen of Candace mm -hmm. in Ethiopia had actually uh, been reading out of the book of Isaiah, and he was reading about the suffering servant. And the Holy Spirit led Philip to, to be actually refers to an angel at that point leading Philip to him. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I except somebody guide me? Mm -hmm. And from that place, he began preaching Jesus to him. Right. And then later, the Holy Spirit tells uh, Paul to tell the young preacher, Timothy, preach the word. Uh, we have this emphasis on the word and the word of God. We sometimes think that the only way to teach Jesus is to teach him out of the New Testament, which is basically true. The New Testament teaches who Jesus is. But they were teaching out of the Old Testament Jesus mm -hmm. because the prophecies were all through the Old Testament, uh, some more so than others, such as Isaiah. But he could go through the Word and show them, this is what you're looking for. And then, of course, as we see in John when he goes to the synagogue, he says, that's me. It's an amazing statement at that point as well, but preaching the Word. And one of the things we need to make sure of today is that we don't get away from that because that seems to be not only an approved standard, but the main way in which God intended for this to actually be done. Uh, we don't need to be talking about all the things around us that uh, have nothing to do with the scriptures really, or I feel this or whatever, but actually just say, hey, take a look at this Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, he's right here in the Word. And all of the law, the, by the New Testament is very clear, all of the law was there to lead us to Christ, to lead us to who Christ. is the Word. Yeah. And so it's so important that we understand that, and when mm -hmm. we can put that together, it, it'll register. It's like mm -hmm. plugging into a power power source. Yeah, absolutely. So then they come unto him, verse 3, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And uh, when they could not come nigh unto him for the press or near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed where in the sick and the, of the palsy lay. So here, imagine we're sitting at home, you're at home, and all of a sudden your roof starts Mm -hmm. crumbling and things are falling down into the room and you're like what's going on here and Jesus happens to be in the room and he's teaching and and, and all this is happening this this was a real event and so put yourself in there and think or the, the idea of his friends this guy with the palsy his friends come around him and they, they want to get him to Jesus they want to get him to the man that we talked about in the last program who has this power to absolutely heal and to mm -hmm. heal immediately and this guy's, yeah. you know, he's got some problems and his friends are willing to help him. A couple of things we want to go back on right here. What is palsy? Do you have a definition for it or what probably they were talking about here? Uh, well, it's like leprosy. I mean, there's all types of things that come up with that. You know, and palsy, I would say, was probably, you know, somewhat disfigured because of whatever the problem mm -hmm. was, whether it was MS or, you know, some mm -hmm. of the diseases that we know today that, that will distort or the muscles or the joints and the person really couldn't walk so be or move on their own. Right, a crippling disease. But it, again, uh, he had friends around him that were willing to carry mm -hmm. his, bear his burden, help him along to get him to where he needed to go. Palsy, we normally think of as a shaking disease like this of some sort, some more so than others. Uh, we have some major uh, celebrities that are uh, dealing with some issues of that in their lives. And, and we understand the, the debilitating nature of it. But this, at this time, would have been a, a totally crippling event not allowing him basically to function otherwise. Mm -hmm. So his friends, uh, they have to love him enough and 
care enough to actually want to get him to Jesus, even though he can't get there himself. And believe that he has the ability to And believe to that they, it'll make a difference, yeah. Now, this house thing, we're not talking about taking uh, the Spanish tile roof apart <laughs> to get you down. These were thatched roofs probably, or, or maybe, uh, you know, some wood and some uh, little twigs and whatnot, and they took a part enough of it to be able to let him down. Um, that would have been unpleasant in many ways. They had to get up on the roof, but that probably wouldn't have been that hard. But then they had to put him in a little uh, stretcher or a little cot of some sort, something to be able to use ropes and, and let him down into it. But then, like you said, this is where Jesus' response is so amazing. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead. So verse 4, And when they could not come nigh unto him, I read that verse 5, I'm sorry. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. This is a major, major statement. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? or speak against God. Who can forgive sins but God only? Mm -hmm. That's a, This is a major statement, a major event that's happening here. Why did this man say this? And immediately, verse 8, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. And this is a big response on Jesus' part, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And here we go. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, as they watched, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. So this is Amazing. a major miracle that took place where Jesus is saying, Your sins are forgiven. And no man can forgive sins, only God. This was, they knew and understood that. So it was reasonable for them to actually reason that in their own mind, saying, what is this guy doing? It's a blasphemy. He's not able to do this. So why well, is he saying that? Again, mm -hmm. if you and I stood up right here on, on television and said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, people would change the dial and start talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and rightfully so. Trash about us, right? Yeah. But rightfully and so. Rightfully so. And, and so, as you mentioned, with authority. The, we have mm -hmm. no power and authority of our own. It's what was given to us by mm -hmm. God because of his word. And, mm -hmm. and he's faithful to his word. And his word always goes forth and accomplish what he wills. Mm -hmm. But Jesus is the real deal. Even the demons acknowledge mm -hmm. that, as we talked about in the last program. Mm -hmm. He was the Son of God. He, Jesus is specifically talking yeah. about this here. It, it's so clear. And, and so we can look back and say, wow, if I was in the room, if I was in the crowd where he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And we're going to talk about these things as mm -hmm. we walk through this gospel and others. Mm -hmm. But it's so important that we put ourselves and understand the time, the culture, the mm -hmm. time of day, the, the, the feasts that were being celebrated, and how much Jesus stood up to point out, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father but by me. Okay, now looking at this from the standpoint of the reasoning uh, Jews there who said, you know, this guy can't do this. This is a blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Only God can forgive sins. Uh, wait a minute now, you're watching Jesus do this, you see him do it, and yet you're still unwilling to accept it on the face level that this is accomplished. You say he doesn't have the right to do that. Now, how sick do we have to be? How legalistic do we have to be to actually look at the power of God and then say, no, that's not right? That's what, he get, what some of them get in trouble for later as well in the so-called... Uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's leave this right here for a moment. Just notice, these people saw it happen and yet were so ingrained with their indoctrination of what they expected and what they thought should happen that they were unwilling to just accept it for what it was. And we'll see that unfold all through the descriptions of the stories of how they reacted to Jesus. And Why what, what happens here is that they're not taking God at His Word. Okay. Here is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. it, 
showing them, mm -hmm. manifesting in their natural senses. This is the as word well. become flesh, as right. John calls and it. And he's yeah. showing them, and, mm -hmm. and they're not willing to take God at his word, even mm -hmm. though they're the religious leaders of their day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I see this in a way. Now, the Bible clearly says, God says, come, let's reason together. Now, they're reasoning, but they're not really reasoning with God. They're mm -hmm. reasoning in their own heart and their own mind mm -hmm. and saying, I don't like this. Go take that and just apply it into the discussions of the mind of God, the mind of the Spirit, as opposed mm -hmm. to the mind of the flesh or the mind of man. Uh, this was what man would have expected, and they said that's not acceptable, as opposed to the mind of the Spirit, which is, God, you're God. Thank you for coming and doing this. And then you see mm -hmm. Jesus in verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves. Jesus was able to see this mm -hmm. in his spirit. This is like a, a mind's eye type of thing, mm -hmm. not to be super spiritual on it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, whether you call this a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or a revelation, whatever you want to call it, the Bible specifically says that Jesus was very much aware of what was going on in their hearts. He and, knew what and, their hearts were, yeah. And, and he's dealing with it. And, and he reasons it out. He really reasons it out. He says, mm -hmm. well, if I say this and you don't like that, how about I say that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> here you go. The guy's healed. Another interesting correlation here is the correlation of sins being forgiven and the healing. Mm -hmm. um, even to the point of in James chapter 5, he says, if anyone is sick, let him call the elders of the church. They'll anoint him with oil. Pray over him and he'll be healed and his sins will be forgiven. Mm -hmm. That's a correlation that we sometimes lose in our modern medical time period in which we don't see a spiritual connection with healing. But in the old times, a lot of times that was an emphasis of it. And it's interesting that the Holy Spirit chooses to make that emphasis here in recording that Jesus says not that you are healed, but your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if there's an implication that the sin is what caused this. And yet we're told later in an incident concerning a blind individual mm -hmm. that that wasn't the case. It was just to show the power of God when Jesus was able to heal him. And so we see here his emphasis, and he says, which is easier to say? Well, honestly, I don't know that there's a difference between them, but apparently there was. Well, that's it. I mean, he cut mm -hmm. right into the reality mm -hmm. of their heart. And I think when you look at the, the idea of by his stripes we are healed, and of course, we want to go for that physical healing. Mm -hmm. We want, to, but but the reality is, our sins are forgiven mm -hmm. when we come to Christ. That's the ultimate healing. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate healing. And if you have that, you have everything. You look at yep. people like uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, who is has been in a wheelchair for decades now, and and says that had she not had that situation happen to her, she probably wouldn't be proclaiming the gospel the way that she is. And she knows on that day, if not in this lifetime, mm -hmm. that she'll be walking with the Lord. She's walking with the Lord now. That's the beauty of salvation and the forgiveness of our sins. So he says here, but that you may know, verse 10, mm -hmm. that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And then he says, rise, take up your bed and walk. Amazing statement because that's really what the whole point of this is. Now go back just a minute to what we said earlier about Mark. Authority, power, mm -hmm. action. It's very much an emphasis of God acting on earth and Jesus is God in the flesh on earth. He is the Emmanuel, God with us. And that you may know that the Son of Man. Now why did he say Son of Man? Why did he say Son of God? Mm -hmm. Well, Son of God would have been a little bit more inflammatory than Son of Man. <laughs> but also, too, there's a precedent for this. Elijah referred to himself as Son of Man. Mm -hmm. And we know that Jesus is actually kind of like the, uh, the type and anti-type of uh, Elijah. And he's the fulfillment of, of what God had planned there. God had shown this before. But it's also an emphasis on the fact that God did become flesh. And so we have not mm -hmm. just God coming to the earth, because, you know, honestly, if God came to the earth and didn't live in the flesh, he would be, I mean, it, the power would be there, it'd be no problem, but he wouldn't be a man doing it, would he? Well, we see God manifesting himself at the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. You know, it says that his glory filled the temple and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But he says, I will dwell among my people. And then that mm -hmm. goes back to the Gospel of John where it says that he came to dwell mm -hmm. among us. Right. So this is the importance of knowing who Jesus is. This mm -hmm. is good news. That's why it's called the Gospel. Yep of Jesus Christ according to Mark. This is this is a very powerful statement. It's a life-changing statement. It's an mm -hmm. eternal life-changing statement. And again, we were all sick and dying in our we were dead in our sin our and trespasses. trespasses and, sins, and yeah. now we have been made alive in Christ. That's a powerful transition that no one else could do but God. Now, when the crowd saw the response when he says arise, take up your bed and go thy way into your house, 
He picked up his bed, went forth before them all, and they were all amazed and glorified God. We've never seen anything like this before. Now this implies that even the scribes who had reasoned that this wasn't right for him to do it this way were amazed and were glorifying God because of it as well. But that should be our response, shouldn't it? That we should respond with the amazement that God has actually done this and that we should then glorify him because really it's all for the glorification that, of God That's anyway. exactly it. You, me, anybody watching, mm -hmm. anybody who's a confessing Christian, whatever, that we, whatever we do is to be done is unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Whatever we do is to be done to the glory of God. Of course, that brings up the negatives too. We've got people that say, well, yeah, but I've seen Christians that didn't do that. Mm -hmm. They did horrible things or they took the praise themselves. Well, yeah, but if you look back in the Old Testament, Moses suffered for having done so. Instead of saying, God's given you this, it says, must I mm -hmm. do this? And God says, hey, you know, it wasn't the fact that you struck the rock or spoke to it in the way you did. It was the fact that you didn't give me the glory. Right. And so you're not going to go to the promised land. Amazing consequence. We can't measure Christianity by those who have presented it in the past in such a way that it is not acceptable to God. We have to accept it on the basis of the way Jesus presents it, and that is in the glorification of God then, and not ourselves. All right. Uh, he went forth again. Well, you know, he's traveling around, didn't he? He's uh, a he man on the move. <laughs> can't, can't stop and be in one place. It's not a mission. But basically they were traveling around the Sea of Galilee is what they were doing, kind of just following the seashore. The multitude re, uh, kept up with him, and he continued to teach them. Now, I don't know how this was done. Uh, maybe he did it in, in small pockets as people would kind of gather around him, and he'd be speaking, and then the crowd would kind of move a little bit. But I get the impression he would stop every once in a while, and they would kind of settle around him, and he would talk some more, and then they'd get up and move some more. Uh, I don't know exactly how that was done. It doesn't give us that detail. It well, later on, later on in the Gospels, it, it does talk about how he sent them out two by two, that they mm -hmm. went before him basically saying, hey, Jesus is coming to town, mm -hmm. probably scouting out or even with the Passover feast, you know, find the place mm -hmm. and all that. But, but you, again, you see the process of Jesus moving, the disciples moving along with him, and then eventually he says, okay, now you go before me. And there's this process because he's training them okay. up in the way that they should go mm -hmm. to eventually, you know, in Acts, he's saying, okay, it's all yours now. Carry it until I come back. Mm -hmm. And so there's this process. So as he passed by, and I like that phrase because it basically just shows that he's moving along. It's almost as if it was incidental. And I, I think that's important to remember that it wasn't so much that he planned on meeting Levi here, but obviously he was. Mm -hmm. It's just that as he passed by, he said, hey, come follow me. And that's just basically what it was. He says, come follow me. Now, Levi, he specifies who he is, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, he says uh, he was uh, taking customs. Uh, we take that normally to mean uh, taxes, but it could have been uh, a toll for some sort of passing through. But he says, follow me. And he got up immediately and followed him. Now, in the case of the fishermen, we can imply that he had previous contact with them, and they were prepared and were ready when he says, come. But Levi, we almost get the impression that this is an incident that's new in which he says, follow me. And Levi just immediately says, okay. Now, to look at that from the logical, reasonable standpoint, that's not reasonable at all. He's got an official position. He's collecting money. Well, probably had uh, uh, people working with him, so it probably wasn't as bad as it sounds to us. But he immediately left that and got up and followed Jesus. We need to be willing and able to drop everything to follow Jesus as well, but see it here actually so starkly presented. It's an amazing statement of how this individual who didn't know Jesus had heard the rumors probably, mm -hmm. but sees him and he, he speaks to him directly, says, follow me, and he immediately got up and followed him. He didn't know what he was getting into at this point. But later no, he no. would find out. <laughs> well, what's nice about this is that you had a culture that was waiting for thousands of years yes. for the promised Messiah to come. Mm -hmm. And and so here you have an instance, as you said, he was probably sitting in his booth while all mm -hmm. this other stuff was going on, mm -hmm. where we know that the disciples who were being discipled under John would mm -hmm. say, behold the Lamb of God, you mm -hmm. know. And so there was that process for mm -hmm. them. But as you said, that he totally said, okay, I'm going to leave this and follow him. Now he immediately takes him home. So Jesus says, follow me, and Matthew says, no, you follow me. That's not really what it was. What he says, well, you need to eat. Come on over here. You know, and that was part of the hospitality of their culture, mm -hmm. of the law of Moses itself. 
So as Jesus said at meet at his house, and here's the emphasis, many publicans and sinners also sat with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Now publicans, that's the King James word, and a publican was a tax collector. So that's another reason we think this is probably what he was doing. This is Matthew later, his name is called Matthew. And he was a tax collector, so his friends would have been tax collectors and sinners. I like the way that says there, publicans and sinners. He doesn't say uh, publicans and other sinners, he just says publicans and sinners, but he implies that that's publicans or sinners as well. And that's again today we have to come to the realization that according to God's word, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. That but in the view of the Jews of that time, they had a, a stratified uh, view of things. You know, the priests were holy men of God and on down the list until finally the average Jew. But if you were a, uh, uh, first of all, if you were a non-Jew, you were a sinner. Mm -hmm. Second of all, if you were doing things for the non-Jews, you were a sinner. And the tax collectors were, t were collecting for whom? They were <laughs> for collecting the for the Romans. <laughs> And, and actually that was a position of, of theft in, uh, in most people's eyes because he had to make money for the Romans. They didn't care how much he collected otherwise. So he'd make his wealth by over collecting, so to speak. And here's Levi sitting at his booth. And uh, of course his, his cohorts are, are publicans also, tax collectors also. And so you can expect the result out of that is gonna be somebody questioning that Jesus would sit down with sinners. It would be like today, Jesus going to an IRS agent Ooh. and sitting and sitting, you know, these are our tax collectors and, and most you of us don't like them. You need to keep better like company them. than that, sir. Right, and so they're, <laughs> they're hanging out together. This mm -hmm. is how drastic it was. Mm -hmm. Except in our view, it wouldn't be the tax collectors for the IRS, it would be maybe the sinner on, uh, on, on, on uh, Skid Row or, mm -hmm. or maybe some other, you know, maybe you're a member of, uh, well, you come from the east of New Jersey. Uh, I understand everybody in New Jersey is a mobster, right? <laughs> uh, I've seen The Sopranos and some of the other shows, so I'm sure that's, tr that's not true, of course, at all. But the point is, the Pharisees now are going to see this, and their response is not, look what Jesus is doing so good. They're going to be instead looking at the details, of, man, but look who he's associating with. So he goes on, verse 16, when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? They didn't ask him, they asked his followers. And when Jesus heard it, he says, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but rather sinners to repentance. Now, is he implying that the scribes and Pharisees were righteous? Or is he just using an argument there at least to acknowledge that hey, you think these guys are sinners, but that's what the physician came for? Mm -hmm. Well, he's hitting them where it's at, but mm -hmm. he's also clarifying himself as we see in the Gospel of John. Here is the great physician. Mm -hmm. here, is, here is God. I am the God that heals you in the midst of people who need healing. And, mm -hmm. it's, and, and he's revealing that to those who think they're already okay with mm -hmm. God. They have an in with God. God mm -hmm. understands where they're at and they're doing everything right uh, according to their feelings or their emotions or, mm -hmm. or their belief system. But Jesus is kind of driving right in there and saying, mm -hmm. you know what, this is what it's all about. The great physician now is near, the sympathizing Jesus, the words of a hymn that we sing. Uh, the point that we probably need to be careful of on this, um, I preach in a church setting, you do as well, Christians gathering together on a Sunday to worship God together. Uh, this is not a gathering of sinners, it's a gathering of, uh, of the righteous, basically. Now occasionally we'll have visitors come in, we'll have somebody come in who's not, and of course we have sin within the group, of, uh, like any human group will be, individuals that need to repent of sin. But basically it's the righteous that we're preaching to. And that's uh, been a struggle to look back on this and say, wait a minute, we're supposed to be preaching to the unsaved. We're supposed to be preaching to the non-righteous. We're supposed to be, as the great physician went, dealing with the people where they are. And people are in sin in the world, are they not? Not just all of us are sinners, but rather they're in sin. And God sees, and God knows, and God's there. That's the reality of it. But here, he's manifest in the flesh. That's that, to clarify, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So God is in the midst irregardless. So his physician analogy that he makes here, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, he says in, in Luke elsewhere. Mm -hmm. The same principle, the idea is 
I have been sent for a purpose, and that purpose is not to go to the temple to talk to the uh, priests, but rather to go to the people and talk to the sinners, talk to the people that need the healing. And he is the good shepherd, mm -hmm. and he's going out to round up the lost sheep. That's right. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but rather the ones who are sick. King James expression, whole, those who are sick as opposed to those who are not. And what we have to recognize is that he says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The word repentance comes up over and over again. We want to take this the last couple of minutes, maybe talk about that for just a moment. Repentance is a big word. Uh, we sometimes even use it in such a way we think of it as a theological word or a divine statement, some sort of a decree. But what does it actually mean? It literally means to turn and think differently. Mm -hmm. If I'm heading in this direction, if I'm heading north, it means to go south. If I'm heading east, it means <coughs> to go west. It, it means to make a full 180. Realize I've been heading in the wrong direction and I need to turn around and make it right. And it's not just a mental change of mind, it's a mental change of mind that results in a mental, in a physical change of life. Then. Because you're not only turning away from something, you're turning towards something. You're turning away from what you mm. have been revealed. This is wrong. This is not good for you. This is the wrong mm. way. Here's the right way. Let's go there. So the publicans and sinners, he's calling them to repentance. He's calling them to renounce what they've been doing and change their, their behavior, change their life. That's a major transition. That's what conversion is all about. That's what Christ comes to you and asks you to do as well is to repent. But here he makes the distinction between those who are righteous and those who aren't. Because the children of Israel were the people prepared by God. They were given the law of Moses. They had a covenant relationship with him, specifically so that he could come. And all of that was to point to him coming as well. But he tells them not here to repent, but he tells them later that they must repent as well because they're all sinners. But here he's making the distinction. Why is he allowing the sinners to sit with Because they thought that made you unclean. They thought that made you unacceptable in the temple anymore. That made you a sinner yourself. And he's making that distinction showing that, no, I came to save the lost. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible concept of repentance. Now, the idea of repentance, it's not a theological concept. This was a common word, actually, that they used at that time. Uh, maybe not the word repentance, which is our, our word for it, but perhaps at least on the standpoint of it being a common word in the uh, Hebrew and Aramaic that they would have used, as well as then the Greek that they would have used at that time. It was just basically, as you said, a change of direction. Stop going the direction you're going in and turn your life around. And we want to be able to say that about Jesus in your life as well. And we pray that you'll consider that Jesus is the answer and that you will also repent in your life as well. Do you have a last thought? Amen. All right. <laughs> My name is Haskell Hallmark with the Rio Rancho Church of Christ in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And Pastor Mark Tross with Victory Church of God in Grants, New Mexico. And the program is Cross Culture New Mexico. And you can look us up on the web on Cross Culture NM. Thank you for being with us. May God bless you as you strive to serve him better every day. Mm -hmm.